that story talks back. Almost everything that we remember, think about, or imagine is a story. Stories entertain us, inform us, and even define us. They have upsides, and they have downsides. This podcast explores the power of story in every aspect of our lives. I'm Dave Stanton. Thank you for joining us. With an equal mastery of both keyboard and drums, Gary Husband has collaborated with a who's who of celebrated musicians in modern jazz and progressive rock. He has toured and recorded with John McLaughlin, Jeff Beck, Jack Bruce, and Alan Holdsworth, and has worked with the likes of Chick Corea, Robin Trower, Sir George Martin, Al Jarreau, and Quincy Jones. Husband is currently in preparations for recording his 12th solo album, One, and is creating a new electric album with guitarist Alf Terjehana. Husband also appears playing both keyboard and drums on John McLaughlin's upcoming album, Liberation Time. Well, Gary, it's uh, great to welcome you to the Story Talks Back. I really appreciate your time and uh, your insight today. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for reaching out to me. Uh, sure. So um, I think you know our theme is stories and storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you have any recollections from your childhood or your formative years of stories and storytelling in your childhood um either in your family or um you know stories that really influenced you when you were younger um i was never really much of a reader um back in those days anyway uh, i was just more into the raw experiencing of essences and, and usually that would it would come to me through um TV music, film music, and uh, yeah, and even films themselves, and photographs. This is another big passion of mine too. This, 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 hmm. a lot of that element in there. Not, not uh, obviously the 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 storytelling aspect, so to speak, but definitely a depiction of something that you want to put over and and, um, and have transmit. And um, I, you know, just a sideline, you know, just a a hair. I remember reading an, an interview with uh, my great hero Tony Williams once, and he he admitted to to being influenced by a lot of TV music and film music. Huh. And and you know, and then I thought, huh, oh, that, that's that's uh, quite a curious answer. You know, that 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 really set me thinking. As did his playing. So it's like you you play who you are, really. And he was full of curious things to say you know very untypical unlikely kind of answers things and it really set you thinking and uh, and that really got me it but but in in more recent years i can really hear how the short form development of a tv theme or a film soundtrack um really is the sort of in a way the most concentrated the most formed um in other words composed uh, or routined uh, form of storytelling. I'm of course involved in much more the, the, the improvisational um, and have been for, for many years, this, this aspect of, of storytelling in improvisation, which is, um, I was only thinking just now, revisiting some of the old Miles Davis Quintet records live and hearing about four or five different Herbie and Miles uh, duets between them. I mean, this this is the, the ultimate in what you're talking about to me, in in the sense of spontaneous storytelling, and at and total empathy between the two of them. I mean, so massively different each 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 version of these huh. live takes, but nonetheless, the most incredible journey and story. And then when that hits, you know, when the band hits, the ba ba ba. Ba, ba, and they're all in. I mean, it's just, I, I don't think I've ever heard anything so affecting. Mm. 
Can you think of one of those early themes that sticks with you that you that's still rattling around in your head? Those TV or movie themes? Oh, sure. And I keep quoting them in solos too. <laughs> in the hope that somebody might go, isn't that the theme from such as <laughs> and but such as so 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 resonating they they all were and still are to me. Um I remember there was an old British film made in uh the 50s or probably the 60s called Whistle Down the Wind. Huh. There's a stage show of it now, but the original film had uh what was the name of the actor, famous uh, now deceased uh, actor. Um, anyway, they, the, the young girl was played by Hayley Mills and she was extremely captivating in her, hmm. in her youthful innocence. And, and, and this man turns up in a barn and he's, he's a convicted killer, basically. Oh, no. And it, I hate to give it all away, but he, he just, says um when she discovers him in the barn he he just lowers his head and goes jesus and she thinks he's jesus mm. so already you're in this place and this theme and i don't even know who the composer was and it was just so it just got it just got me every time you know and it and just in terms of the way it was was so perfect for the for what was happening in the film but also just totally resonating in emotionally as a theme and, and very uh when you go back and watch these old old films now you you really get a sense of um their charm uh unique to the period in which they were made and and uh you know and the the way it was shot and the and the, and the acting styles and mm. And stuff and the black and white and everything. So I mean, it's 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 all part of it. It's it's all part of building this essence, which uh, you know, I'd go see the Beatles movies and and take uh, some of those some of those songs I was hearing for the first time, just the ballad, just just the the one four four five chords, mm -hmm. just a haunting theme, and this would just go on and on and on and on, and uh, and and the way. And getting back to your, your original question, uh, David, I'd go in the room upstairs uh, where my father's piano was, just a tiny little room, and turn all the lights off and take this theme and expand on it and develop it and mm -hmm. just, just play right. it and find different harmonies, it, harmonies to, to create different effects on it or try and superimpose some other kind of harmony with it just to, to, to let it live in another way. So. This was all like developing this uh, more spontaneous, uh, you know, storytelling aspect as a soloist. Mm. I, I'm not getting on to, to what happens with other people as such yet. I'm just explaining um, the way I used to disappear into this room and, and, you know, people in the family would ask, you know, where, where is he? Where, where is he gone now? What's he doing? <laughs> and my mom would say, oh, he's upstairs playing the scene. Mm. And I love the way she gave it that title because it's exactly what I was doing. And, um, and I'm pretty much uh, that way out now, writing and, and, and forming new music and ways to go for myself in music. And uh, it's, it's all still there, you know? <laughs> so, so I relate very much to this aspect of, of the storytelling. So when you're talking about like Miles and Herbie Hancock, you know these dialogues that they would have mm. i mean can you can you sort of uh, verbalize what about that seems to be storytelling or what makes it rise to the level of storytelling in your mind i think that they found this this total ease and empathy with each other to the point where they would they would have flung themselves into complete um uh, I wouldn't say random, but but uh, uh, a complete space without any form, without any organized harmony, only only the slightest little allusion to to the theme of Round Midnight. Sometimes, mm -hmm. even though Miles would be playing it, Herbie would be inventing this thing and carrying Miles in a different way, and they would be talking together and forming this together in a very magical and unique way to them. And um, 
this this whole trajectory was made for the most incredible story mm. and, and a new one every time mm -hmm. you know if you go back it, it's i think it's a white cover with black and orange print and it's miles it's a, it's a whole set of miles davis quintet live and you'll hear about five six maybe versions around midnight and it, each one is a total jewel and and, and you i'm just left you know just shocked by it as you know as if i've written no as if i've written as if i've experienced or been told the most amazing captivating story so uh it's a real big part of music for me and and um and i'm and i'm chasing it all the time you know whatever way i can personally just in my own development and creation so uh yeah they they were something together i i, I don't think I really experienced something so amazing mm -hmm. between two musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, although, of course, there, there are endless, many thousands and millions of examples of people uh, creating wonderful tensions together, wonderful stories together. But but these two were something which is actually I was at odds with Alan about Alan Holtless for because huh. he wasn't a fan of Miles. Really, interesting. No, we didn't actually see people, things on the same page a lot. Um, uh, I couldn't understand what he didn't like about Miles, but in a way I could see it because he, he had this, he's obsessed with the beautification of everything. And, 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 the, and Miles had too many rough edges. Huh. Uh, he would gravitate to Kenny Wheeler, some, an equally great musician, but my mind was Miles always. And, Interesting. and uh, you know, I'd go on and, and, and buy these uh, these albums of in a silent way and bitches brew and, and, and all these things and what, what journeys these were. Mm. Sonic journeys too, because there there's mixing as many as two, three, even four pianists on, on one session. It's a right. totally new realm and, and sense of texture for to to build and, and collectively form something together. Really amazing time. Do you feel like when two people are improvising together that they're kind of taking on characters that they uh, sort of are playing in a sense as a character? Somehow, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I really sort of hate thinking in spontaneous creating mode. Um, I really try and shut that part of, of everything off, you know, I think the psychiatrists call it the chatter, right. you know, when, when you're suffering from some kind of, uh, you know, thought patterns and they just won't go away and whatever else is ignore the chatter or in meditation, when you get this thing like right. what's going on, what am I seeing, what am I getting, what am I supposed to feel, what, you know, and all these questions coming up, and you go, let those questions come and leave, just monitor them going mm. and, and there you 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 stand your best chance of remaining in in uh, the the optimum moment really the most conducive place for just uh pure interaction mm -hmm. which by the way uh, the, because i'm working i've been working with john mclaughlin for the for a long time now uh, as right. principally a keyboardist and and during the sets we uh we do a, just a duet version of a tune called Senor CS, which he composed for, it's on an album called um, Industrial Zen, the okay. first album that I got to, to play on by him. So, but we just do the theme as a, a like a colo voce, as they say, piano following the guitar and this kind of conversational thing in amongst presenting the theme, an expansion on, on, on the theme, which is a really nice theme. Uh -huh. And uh, just to follow him, uh but it's a combinational thing isn't it, it it's uh you you've got i try to find a way to put myself in mind of a herbie not copy uh, of a herbie and miles uh, mm -hmm. and, and and the fact that it it will be different hugely different every time mm -hmm. and it, it really turned out to be one of my personal highlights from the fourth dimension shows uh, that we do that and they could they could be long they could be kind of moderate length sometimes they they take quite a journey <laughs> and and he would choose i mean he he's a wonderful study because he, he really is a master of this uh flying with the moment kind of thing 
he, he will, um, and, and for as long as it takes sometimes, he'll mm. be playing, he'll, he'll, he'll walk off the stage, very Milesian, I know. <laughs> uh, it's, very, it's nice for the audience that they're going, where's he gone? And, and, and then on stage, we're in, in the band, we're going, where's he gone? You know? <laughs> and he'll just be walking. And uh, in a sense, this walking is kind of feeling the energy of the moment, the, the, con the, the continu continuation of, of this uh, homing in on this instinct, creative instinct, as to what can happen right. and where it comes. Does it come right. there or does it wait? Another big word, another great musician said to me, Jack Bruce said to me, you know, I'm really happy with, early on when I was playing with him, because we played a lot together, he'd say, uh, it's it's great what you're doing, and I feel really great, you know, when we're playing. But sometimes I wish you could just wait. Mm. And, uh, to you, yeah, he so, said yeah. it. With this very kind of Zen-like instruction, like, what does that mean? You know, wait for what? Is it a, a time thing? Is it a time feeling thing? Is it a pulse thing? Is it be back on the beat? Is it about the actual time you take to? To answer, should you should you pause? Should I use more pauses? Um, is he alluding to the fact that I could be much more? It would be much more nice for him if he, if I was to just hold back and pause. You know, in a sense, use silences to say things. Um, and I, and I'd often wonder. I never I never did really get to the bottom of that with him because he just kind of look well. You know what I mean. <laughs> Well, of course, I don't. <laughs> None of us know anything. We just go with with this. We we I guess we we go with the notion of of that kind of obtuse instruction sometimes, and uh, and and what it does to us, what it sets it off, uh, what it sets off in us. And apparently, Miles Davis was a, 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 a an absolute beyond master of this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it just in terms of, of what you want to bring about in terms of s setting up for the moment, putting putting people at ease and ready for, for doing something like that and, and what and how they go about getting what they want out of you. I mean, you're talking about some of the people you played with and yes, playing on their compositions, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so in a way, you know, the situation kind of sets them up as the hero of the story in a sense, because they're the ones who've composed it. They're the ones who are the, yeah. lead, the lead voice in a sense. Lead so voice. how do you find the process of expressing yourself and fitting yourself into that story? Is that something that just comes very naturally or is it different with every person you play with? Oh, it, it's totally different and totally unique to, to um, everybody because m most important to me you know beyond knowing the compositions and knowing the forms and knowing the keys and and whatever else and playing you know good notes <laughs> detail finding uh -huh. good things to but um and good textures and so forth is is the is how much the person the artists themselves matter to me and i always say to you to young musicians hopefully and in an encouraging way to to really research these artists, research their back catalog mm. uh, often, and and research the people they played with. What did they like about those people? Well, I noticed that particular drummer played on a few of the albums. What was it about him you liked? You know, how did he serve your songs in the way that you know? Were there any shortcomings in what so and so did? Uh, how would you know are there any kind of expansions you'd like to see and, and really and really show them that you've taken an, a keen interest in them and, and that you've really researched them and delved into their output and stuff and really that's a very flattering thing hmm. it really gets you gets you a good score with people <laughs> that make, make an impression find out all you can about them which is not hard now because we've got the the internet it used to be used to be difficult more difficult but um it's it's not only out of duty i feel that i honestly feel the responsibility to do that 
um, um, because of of the the hugeness of my estimation and respect and 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 adoration of them as artists mm. and what they do and of the moment that happens to find me in the equation being able to take part in this conversation and in a sense being trusted with a with a moment with a moment a little utterance that john could make sometimes i've just come off and bend the string down with a whammy bar just a sigh in music how would i respond to that and and what does it say if i respond to it kind of frenetically or if i just leave a total silence um, how poignant can that moment be and, and i'm not thinking about it i'm just going with an instinct of yeah silence play nothing from that mm -hmm. and then do it again as if to kind of go hey i'm here i'm here and we're speaking we're speaking and i'm going i know i know playing you know in 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 the music and answering each other that way it, it, it's it, it's it, if it if we really achieve it right um it's very touching for the audience because they're a part of that and not only are they a part of that they they know that that will never happen again in the same way on another concert mm. and and that's that's a beautiful thing to know mm. and, and be a part of this is just something that you or nobody else will experience in that way ever again and uh, that's all very captivating stuff sure but here you are you have this responsibility to the music of somebody else who's mm -hmm. also in many cases a hero of yours mm. uh, and who's a hero of many other people um, and at the same time you're trying to express yourself in that situation you know so you you gary have mm. a certain style you have certain things to say right and it's so much different than just going to the piano in the attic by yourself Oh yeah, just playing what you want. So, yeah. Do you find that you even have different styles or different sounds and personalities depending on who you're playing with to to fit with their music? Yeah, um, I think that's all part of uh, um, being open, um, and 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 really a result. I, sh I should say of of my following the path to be the kind of musician that I saw in certain others where they apply themselves to very different different and various musical spectrums and styles and realms. Um, if I point to any of my really favorite people, they've all been involved in um, at some at some point in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pop kind of environment almost hmm. sometimes in rock sometimes, you know, with Jack Bruce, for instance, I I heard him sing opera in German. <laughs> you don't just, you know, come through that to to arrive at that stature, just playing blues clubs. You know, mm. even though he was absolutely, totally drenched in in real blues. To me, I thought he was absolutely the real thing, but at the same time, he's got an you know, out of a passion for for wanting to be of a, a lot of different kinds of things and not really limit his creativity or input into any chosen way specifically, he'll be picking things out of, of many different styles of, of things he's either been exposed to or involved with. And, and this leads to the most, a, a much more complete and much more intriguing kind of artist in, in, in my view. So a lot of, a lot of my favorites have, have really been uh, quite schizophrenic in that way, I guess. You <laughs> and but yeah, and there's a price to pay for that because um, I've I've come up and been involved in in more traditional songwriting realms, um, rock realms, a lot of jazz, uh, from from almost traditional through to abstract. Uh, of course, my classical studies, uh, in which I was introduced to the to the amazing music of Stravinsky and Bartok and whatever. And, and since those uh, being exposed to, to that and, and through those artists, life was never going to be the same again. Mm. Uh, it, 
it's like being touched by this becoming aware of, of, of some kind of infinitely great sense of and 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 dimensions that 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 wouldn't have occurred to me before i mean for years i was playing bella bartok microcosmos um, exercises thinking that they were just independence exercises hmm. and the accidentals in those uh, because the piano would be playing a lot in contrary emotion um, and you think is that not wrong does that really go out of key like that does that really diametrically oppose what you're doing in the right hand is that supposed to be like that and mm -hmm. i honestly thought they were mistakes until i learned to to really hear them and it, and it took it took a minute to to hear atonality or bitonality as i sort of more readily uh, thought of it um and the and the relationships that aren't obvious you know the, the people will say in, in music uh it, it's not um it's not an accepted uh part of of the uh, vocabulary yeah the vocabulary uh there's a certain phrase and i can't think of it now anyway it's just that, that note isn't right it doesn't fit and and it's and it's therefore wrong and the classical side would come up with all these rules and people like bartok and Schoenberg and, and, and quite a lot of others were, were slowly but surely uh, just blowing these confines, uh, you know, to smithereens and 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 coming up with uh, new tensions and dimensions in in, in the construction of music. So I, I, I was um, forgotten where we were going with that, but. Yeah, it's, it's all intriguing stuff, but it, I think we were talking about <clears throat> it all adds up to be the most complete artist that you can. <clears throat> and to me, if you can become the most complete artist you can become, you become more effective with making people feel something, taking them on a journey and telling them, on a, telling them a story in essence. So we, keep, we, we come back around to this thing. Um, some of my favorite uh, responses to when people say I've enjoyed something I've been a part of or I've done myself, for instance, say, uh, I was in a field and uh, it was a slightly cold wind, but it started to get warmer and, uh, and I started to other sensations walking through this big field um, in the morning. I say, okay, so he sees, he feels this very much as a morning thing and he's in a field, so it's wide open. And, and you get a real sense when, when people like to explain themselves, care to explain themselves that way, of, of how they're experiencing your music, because how do we know? We never know, really. It's, we just hope that they find, you know, listeners find something that, uh, which, which gets them. That's, that's, that's all I've wanted to do in music, sort of take them on a journey. Mm. You, you sort of touched on the idea of technique, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, is it, is it an equation that the more technique you have, the more stories you can tell, the better storyteller you are, or is no. it not that simple? I, I, I don't believe it's got too much to do with the technique. I mean, I, I think there's, there's this, there's this understanding of, of technique, like working on your technique, shredding, you know, uh, that people use all too readily these days, which is just uh, basically being able to play very cleanly and execute things at a faster rate and have them clean and, and have a lot of notes very clear and come out, you know, one thing. I mean, drums. <clears throat> people want to get this uh, incredible balance and incredible speed and facility. I don't think of technique as facility. I think I think of technique as as getting something, the technique of getting something over inside music that can be affecting, and that can uh, that that can hit people in a deep way. You know, I, I remember reading one. Uh, I I used to love reading. Um, having said I was never a big reader, I used to love reading interviews with great musicians, people who I felt were absolute intriguing people and, and masters in their field. And it might have been 
Joe Zavano, another hero, who said that uh, five minutes before the show somewhere, he took a walk outside just to get some air before the concert. And he'd walk around the block and on his way, turning back around him on himself and his way back to the venue, a man, or was it a woman, passed him and in his face, in his, in his or her face, they saw everything. It was like an old person. And, and there was, there was a, something about the, what they had in their face that so profoundly and deeply affected him that it was almost a part of everything he did. He took that to the stage and, and, and brought that into his, I mean, his, his mood certainly, but, but just from the depth that that experience gave him, just looking into an old person's face and picking up on that. Now, th that to me was, was, was much more, uh, I was much more comfortable with that idea than, than actually trying to get technique really blazing and really fast and really clean, uh, even though I love technical players, but it, it, it's, it's the ones, it's what you're saying and what's behind what you're saying, what prompted it, what was there, what made you go that deeply, what made you go that deeply in that way, you know, and that all of that is so intriguing to me. And I think that that can also be construed as technique in a way, mm -hmm. the technique of, of um, cultivating as, as much artic articulation and, 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 and uh, as much contact with these uh, very deep essences and feelings. I, I really relate to that anyway. It speaks a lot for me. Some people think, oh, what does that mean? But I, it, it's the difference between me remembering a Beatles song from the 60s and, and not remembering it. That's how big I think of it, you know? Because, it, because it has that, that because, soul or that whatever? It, has something. It can be just that the second violin in the in the string section is was a little further away from the microphone, and it gave a little uh, emptiness in the harmony there. And it was so. Mm. It, when you hear the complete thing recorded again, it doesn't hit you in the same way. It can be any infinite little bit of detail in the music that can make. Uh, people fall in love with their own demos. This is this thing that so many musicians call demoitis, where <laughs> you cannot replace, you cannot get the essence of what you had on your first thing, even though it's impossible to use it because it's scrappy and it sounds terrible and it's in terrible quality, but it had it. And you can't get it. All you can hope for really is to kind of get it, hopefully saying as much and, and as powerful, but you're never going to get it in the same way. Interesting. So it's very intriguing, and, and all these things I think of in terms of technique, how to best, uh, how to make better quality demos. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> For instance. Well, thinking so, about your own composition, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about improvisation, mm -hmm. but you're also a composer. Um, you're in the process of recording some new material right now. Yeah. Um, how? How did you find your voice as a composer, or do you feel like you're even still trying to do that? Oh, it'll never stop, really. The 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 search and the reach. Um. Uh, it's interesting to go back and revisit. No, I've, I've been re I've been writing for the better part of my playing career for sure. Uh, only they haven't necessarily been sort of public things, and a lot of things. Um, have not really been aired, uh, so to speak, or given any profile. But um, it, it, it is it is uh, pertinent to say that the 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 act of com composition to me also tallies in to this subject in, in, and deals with storytelling absolutely, but but in a way that's much more rigid, set and rigid in terms of a composition, like. How many times does this melody repeat some, you know, even in a pop tune, how many, how many times will that sung phrase be sung? But Vakrite used to do it five times sometimes. I mean, he was a master of this. He's talking mm -hmm. about the 
optimum effect you can get from how many times a phrase is repeated. A lot of people opt for three. I'm a big three guy. I like the third time because the, the thing can be said first time, you know, did you have fun tonight? You know, second time, did you have fun tonight? You know, but the third time, did you have fun tonight? <laughs> the third time has really got something for me. And, 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 and if left on the third note and, and not, even though it feels like it wants to be uh, articulated a fourth time, I'd like to leave it on the third time. So I'm a bit of a troublemaker in that regard. I, li I like pro being provocative with it. And, and, and I think it's, it's really at the root of a lot of my own writing. Um, it's one of the things at the, at the root of my own writing. Yeah, and, and um, this new record I'm, I'm working on right now with a, with, with a great guitarist from uh, Norway called Alf Terje Hana. Uh -huh. Stavanger, Norway, and uh, he's he's really magical and really innovative and textures and and feeling you know and he's an ex art student. A, a lot of my favorite people are ex art students. Something in that you know, it, it's it's the visionary side again. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, the abstract painter in some of these people in the way that they approach composition or improvising, whatever. But um, yeah, we're, he's, he's pretty much uh, guitar and textures. I'm keyboards, drums, um, and we'll, we'll have a spread section of different bass players for the album. So it, it won't, get, won't get boring. So if you were going to say like, yeah, take one of your compositions mm -hmm. and say, this really represents me. This is, this is something where I feel like I spoke from my voice most clearly, um, or I did something that really uh, I, I feel I'm behind some sort of 100%. Can you think of something that comes to mind? Yeah, I can think of a couple of things. Um, there were two, two big emotional records that I made were, um, were consisted of piano drastically reformed interpretations of uh, music by uh, respectively uh, John McLaughlin and another one before that uh, for Alan, Alan Holtworth's music. I was going to bring that up, the things I see, right? Oh, okay. So, I mean, you, you, you get, thank you, by the way, but you, you get an idea of um, what's different about uh, the original uh, as compared to uh, what I attempted to do with it, because I, I, I warned Alan, I mean, if you want to hear an amusing anecdote, I said, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to take a hammer to your music. <laughs> and I'm going to take some themes or certain motif type things or riffs that come up and, uh, and try and put it together in a, another way and in, in, a, in a very different sort of medium. You know, some of these things, I'm sure if you've heard that record, you'll you'll hear is quite classical. Mm -hmm. that, that, that stuff is um, without intention, just coming back and and haunt, especially the the um, impressionist composers. They hated being called that, by the way. Impressionist composers, they hated that tag. Huh. But to me, it was kind of perfect. not that bad at all, actually. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of those essences came into it. Um, I, I think the value of knowing the person was was uh, paramount because um, first off, I knew that he wouldn't want a direct cover of anything. He was against covers, he was against transcriptions. He said, but what are you gonna do with it that I don't know, you know? Uh, that I know, you know, like a cover version, I know, mm. you know, we did it. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what I wanted to try to give to the listeners of Alan's music, um, a, a, a little view of what could, how those pieces could be kind of reconstructed um, from the point of new view of being extremely close to Alan. Uh, first of all, knowing that about him, that he didn't like covers and also to take license 
which is what he always invited me to do as a drummer, um, com- to the point that he wouldn't have any idea at all. You know, I, he, I'd say, come, what kind of beat do you hear to something? And he just, you know? And I go, no, I don't know. Because you're the only one that can hear that. You know, I can see your head going. And, and I know that you're, you're feeling something, but I don't know what it is, but that was on purpose. And because uh, he didn't want me to know what it was made up of. He wanted me to just get an idea of the way he felt. And, and I'd take that little head bounce and I'd see where the emphasis was somehow in him. I, I could see like if he played a piece through his, his really kind of seemingly random way of tapping tapping his foot, which appeared to have nothing to do with anything sometimes, that would be significant to me. It would be a really short insight into, into the way he was feeling it. Um, also these little pushes and push, uh, pulls and pushes in music, little, little rallentandos and little uh, accelerandos, much akin to classical music that he'd take were also uh, really special to me to pick up on and to have the drums really define that and and not just play through it as if it's a kind of stretched thing, but the tempo is always there. These would always kind of elongate, bring a kind of rubato feeling to those moments, which was much more akin to how he used to actually play them to me in his front room, his acoustic guitar. and I said, oh, there's a little pause there. And you do it every time there, you know? And I, I said, can I record that? And he goes, sure. And he'd do it again in that same spot, but differently. This time he'd kind of push it more. Uh, it wasn't so much of a pull. And all these things, very, very insightful of the deeper process, and more the, the deeper part of him and his unique way of feeling the music than, than they were of, me thinking, oh, there's there's four and a half beats there. You know, what am I going to do? It doesn't mean to say it will be four and a half beats once you've injected this little rubato moment and then come back in and then the music will start from that point again. And these are these were very inherent in a lot of his right, even until the end. You know, a lot of, a lot of his ballad writing specifically was 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 there was so much of this little pushes and pulls, just little, very subtle things. But they should have, they, they were always supposed to be picked up by drums for me, you know, and he, and he loved that. And, and <laughs> it got to the point that because we played so often for what, 37 years? Uh, long time. So it's a long time to sort of get used to reading somebody and, and feeling almost sort of preempting what they're going to do and, 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 and usually getting a sense of what's going to happen between us, which was always a big feature of what we had together. Not to say that every time we played together, it was always fantastic because it wasn't. I mean, we, 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 we just would not be able to connect at all some nights, but most of the time it was quite, um, it was spookily uh, uncanny in a way, how, how we just managed to kind of like, it would be there. And, and in spite of a, a pause or a pull and something undetermined in any kind of rigid rhythmic sense, and we just come out like, and, and, and that to me just reinforced, it's, it, I, I could, we were lucky enough to find this little thing that between us that, that, that we can do so much sometimes that we can't not do that. You know, and, it, and uh-huh. it, it was that close. It really was, and and I was sort of blessed to find it. And I know that he was looking for, you know, in the seven, the late seventies when we got together, he was looking for exactly that. But with the power of, he loved the power of rock music, and he hated regularity in drumming. He wanted a strong, ever-changing, um, improvisational uh, underpinning. Not underpinning, but but activity throughout everything. You like concentrate the moment anything repeated in terms of a, a drum beat as such i was like oh man you know break break you know can we leave it open just open out again 
and he <laughs> loved the air coming into it. He loved the sea coming into it. He loved the earth. Uh, he loved the the energy. He loved the passion. He loved the the pauses, the silences. All of that was very important to him. So I I really found myself in the most incredible situation with him um, in terms of without even really trying. And certainly it was never anything we'd speak of. Hmm. And we and and together we 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 tell some stories. <laughs> we did. It's interesting though that you, you know, you started out talking about Miles and Herbie. Yeah. And you know, when I asked you about your favorite compositions of your own, you cited some things that are dialogues between you and another composer, another player. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like this whole idea of of two characters talking together or mm. communicating or learning to communicate is is really central to to what you love in music and and the way you like to tell stories it is it is but also this this the, the aspect of of those two piano albums the interpretation albums both of those are very much a creative uh was su such a creative uh challenge and journey for me because I started with, with, with virtually nothing except just maybe some melody lines uh, and nothing, you know, a, a lot of people didn't like, like it because it wasn't derivative enough of the original, mm. but that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't promise anybody I was gonna do that. I, I, I just wanted to totally explore it from new and build it again. So um, in a sense, it's, it's almost like a, bringing your own compositional the, you know, things that occur to you inside of your own creative and compositional process to the table as much as what I'm using of that artist. So the, the fondness about those albums, it, it's kind of like where, where the second one for, for John McLaughlin, I, I uh, purposely called a meeting of spirits, of course, mm -hmm. based on uh, a meeting, uh, what, what is it? The meeting of spirits or whatever it is or meeting of the spirits so a meeting of the spirits implies that it was a meeting of two spirits basically so but and and that was kind of like the the central core of the way that music was constructed and is in a sense being a, a almost equal compositional thing between myself and them so um i feel very close to them as if as if in a compositional way as, as as well as them being based on however loosely somebody else's material but the yeah there are things that i've done um uh especially from the the past there's nothing like covid19 <laughs> pandemic to to bring out this thing uh, i want to go back and research what what i had going in i want to look at this period with so and so or this period i was doing myself maybe i can you know uh and, it, and it's interesting because you can pick up, particularly when it's your own music, and, and remind yourself, oh, okay, I remember looking at that and the way we could do this. And I've, I brought quite a few things back and, and featured them on my Bandcamp page. There are a few Bandcamp page for me, but, but, but uh, what is it? GaryHusband.Bandcamp.com is the real one for me. Okay. So I'm able to introduce all these... Uh, uh, things from yesteryear as, as you know, up against uh, new compositions, compositional things that I'm doing um, in on that band camp. So it, it's nice to have an outlet for that because it's, sure. it's just nice, nice to be able to sort of let people hear this music. Um, so if you think about, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 that's, uh, please. Uh, if you think about you know, your own story in music, you know, your own development, your own arc of growth. Where, where do you see it going from here? Do you have any sense of goals or directions or things you want to accomplish? I just wanted to make the most affecting music I can, David. That's, <laughs> and that sounds like a life's work to me, beyond a life's work. <laughs> I know that um, so, much, so much has got to do with, with what's, what's not in control. I, I think just um, 
to the point that sometimes you can get an essence something in the middle of the night you got to get up man <laughs> you know you got to get up get to a piano what is that got to make a note of that and i am so happy i i did that in the morning my partner she's not too happy about it at all <laughs> definitely isn't happy about it <laughs> but i have to it's the way it's it's the nature it's like when it comes i'm here and i'm not hanging around mm -hmm. so so I learned that from my dad, who used to also get up in the middle of the night and just note things. And even if we, now we have the phone so we can sing an idea into there and, and invariably, hopefully, in the morning, ah, oh, yeah, now, yeah, I remember, remember, and it had this kind of motion to it. So, um, yeah, just uh, really just striving and, and working ahead. Um, the the I continue to be quite schizophrenic in a way with the, the musical areas thing. There's a record that really nobody knows too much about called Mountains to Climb Still. And um, it's kind of variations on themes by a composer called Martin Crample. But on that, I, I got to arrange for classical string trio, uh, piano, violin, and cello. Wow. For the first time. Um, so I'm really happy about that. That was released about a year ago, although it's, it's not really receiving too much in the way of promotion or anything, but it's on Spotify. Okay. Folks. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it, it, I'm really proud of that. The only down thing about that is um, uh, I sing on one track, which wasn't the greatest idea. But, hey, <laughs> that's what the client wanted. What, uh, what do you sing? I sing a ballad. I mean, I, I took about, just like the Interpretations albums, I took the first three phrases of melody of his and built an entire new song from them, for, from that point. So I guess you could say that's more of a co-writing thing. Um, and so I took that melody, the first stages of it, because I didn't like where it went. So I said, uh, Luckily, he's really open to the idea of take your own journey with these things. So I did that and, and built a kind of ballad song out of it. And uh, had somebody good write some lyrics and tried to sing it. Hey. That's awesome. I remember singing again. Oh, no. <laughs> That's great. I love yeah. that. It's, 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 it's great to try it. If, if I have a force, I sing like somebody's concierge, but... but um, or somebody's dog. <laughs> uh -huh. so, no, I'm sure it sounds great. If you can get a feeling without any kind of voice, which I don't have, and or technique or anything, as long as you can get the feeling. And I felt that song a lot that day. I really felt the the, the desolation in, involved needed to sing or portray that song. So it, it's there. You know, yeah. once once people get through laughing, they can uh, <laughs> think, hang on a minute. That's actually, but obviously, you know, I'm sure it's, it's good. Got a nice feeling to it. So yeah, I'm I'm just creating and having fun and trying to continue and and uh, find new ways really on both my instruments and as a and as a composer. Cool. Wherever I can, I'd like to do films. If you hear mountains to climb still, you'll you'll hear how I how I could do films mm. because uh, there's always been a vision of something or a memory, and I can write that. I can write on that. I hope you get I, to do that. I, I hope so. And, and if I could do something as affecting of as Michel Legrand did on the. Formula One film of 1970, uh, Le Mans, mm. Stephen Green. Oh, that just devastates me, that theme. Um, Angels in America, that soundtrack. Um, I have trouble remembering composers' names. Uh, John Barry, I think, wrote uh, the theme from Somewhere in Time, mm. um, about time travel, a love story. That yep. was, I can never get that out of my head. That's That's... But it's also in a composition of mine as a tip of the hat. Thank really? you, Barry. You know, 
but all these people were master writers. I understand exactly what Tony to Tony Williams meant. Mm. TV music and film music. Wah! I mean, what? When you're playing with Miles Davis, I mean, what are you talking about? Now I understand. I understand completely. Yeah. Well, it's great to experience your your passion for other musicians and and for music. So, really appreciate your time, Gary. I am extremely thankful you yeah you reached out and wanted to speak about. Yeah. I hope we covered uh, what you wanted to cover. Oh, we covered we covered a lot of ground. <laughs> I mean, it's or you did anyway. I just like say, go and please listen to the music because it says infinitely more than I could ever say in words. So mm. uh, you want to experience the loveliness of a theme. How can you ever explain that? So mm -hmm. that's why the music's there. <laughs> Got it. And, and long may as all, if, if I'm interested to say one thing, this, sure. this, this isolation thing brought about by this pandemic is has just been so awful for uh, for people who depend on interaction and, and this conversational thing and the storytelling thing in, in music. Um, that we're to the point we're all trying to assimilate it now, mm. out of experience, out of the experience of playing with that person or whoever you're relating to, and you're learning to to almost imagine what they do on it. And and you're you're actually it's kind of you're reacting and and being mm. a protagonist of certain things in a duet, for instance, and just from the point of view of knowing them and knowing how they play, and they're doing the same back. Although it's easier for them because they're working off something slightly easier, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's tremendously hard to get this conversational thing back with with not doing it in real time. So we'll we'll all get better and uh, keep wearing masks and hopefully get rid of this thing. Right. Get back to the in-person conversations. Oh, please. <laughs> please. Crazy, right? Yeah. Huh. Really, really too much. It's so. been great speaking to you, Gary. I really appreciate your Thanks. time. Thanks. I really appreciate it too. Thanks. The Story Talks Back is produced and hosted by Dave Stanton. The music you're hearing now was written and performed by Christopher Daydream. The theme music at the beginning of our show is an excerpt from Play by Merlin Twelfthoven, performed by Carlos Quartet as part of their 50 for the Future series. Please subscribe to the Story Talks Back on Podbean and check us out on Instagram. See you next time.